You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. And thank you for joining us for another great edition of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And I am very pleased and honored to have both a friend and wine lover, Mr. Charles Joseph, whose Hi. family owns the shop right here in town. And more importantly, besides being part of the business, has brought in this fantastic, fantastic looking <laughs> cheese plate. <laughs> which we'll be pairing with some amazing wine tonight, hopefully. So Absolutely. thank you, Charles. Thanks, thanks for having me. And uh, we're gonna be tasting four now. We're gonna start off with the bubbles. I know I've already pre-poured you guys your bubbles up here. This is a French sparkling. It is, uh, my French is a little bad. It's probably, yours is probably gonna be a little better. <laughs> I don't know about that. It is a Jean-Charles Bosset. Um, it's the in bubbles right now, especially in the city, especially in New York City. It's French. Um, it was strongly influenced by where he grew up in the Burgundy region of France. And my notes say it's sort of uh, the Côte d'Or region, which translates roughly to the Gold Coast in France. And the number 21 on the bottle signifies the French Agricultural Department's labeling of the Côte d'Or region. So this was so important to him when he, was manu when he was designing this, putting this wine together, that that's why the number 21 is on it. And this also will age well, which is very unusual for a sparkling under the, under the $20 range, and that's where this is, under the $20 range. This actually will do well if you put it in your basement for a, a little time. So what will we be tasting with this, Charles? Okay, so for the bubbles, we're going to be using a St. Angel Brie. So I'm sure everybody's familiar with Brie cheese. The St. Angel Brie is a triple cream Brie cheese, um, and I just think it's one of the most delicious Brie's that I've ever tasted. Um, it's very creamy, very velvety, um, goes great with sparkling wines. You could also do it with a dessert wine if you like to. And a lot of times when I have brie, uh, I bake it in the oven. Mm -hmm. uh, did you do that tonight or is this just no, room No, this is going to be served at room temperature. Okay. Um, a lot of people do like baking brie's. It makes for a great dessert. Um, this brie um, we're serving at room temperature, which is a good tip of serving you know, most cheeses. Mm -hmm. Allowing the cheese to come to room temperature really helps to bring out a lot of the flavors and some of the nice smells that come along with cheese. What That's, does that sound familiar? Wine and cheese. I, You're already getting the connection <laughs> there. Say, yes. Well, red wine at least. Yeah, yeah. you've got to let the wine open up and breathe a little and, and the cheese needs to, to come to room temperature and kind of get acclimated too. So. Yep, that's right. So which piece of cheese will that be, Charles? Okay, so let me give you guys each a cracker here. And we've been waiting to do a cheese and wine show for quite some time. It's very difficult sometimes to, to eat on the show, but I think we've got it really tight and well prepared today, so I think we're going to yep. do a good job. Yeah, we've been talking about this almost since day one. We have. And, and here we are four years into this show and finally getting to the cheese episode. <laughs> Making dreams so. come true. That's what ShopRite's all about. Guys, so. <laughs> all right, let's take our bite. Thanks. That's very nice, very creamy. That's, that's what I love about Brie. It's so creamy, so rich. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just, it's, it's coating the whole mouth. Mm -hmm. And being that it's a triple um, cream, you know, there's a much higher fat content mm -hmm. in the cheese, and that's why you get richer flavors, creamier textures to it. So if you really want to treat yourself, that's the way to go. And my first sip, this really pairs very well with this cheese. There's a crispness and a sort of an apple flavor to this bubbles, which sort of complements the cheese very well. I got apple on the nose, too. So it's that apple quality just runs throughout the entire tasting process. Mm. And there's no lying here, Charles, if you don't like it. It's either thumbs up or yeah. thumbs up. <laughs> you don't have to lie to us when it comes to okay. tasting. Well, hard to go wrong with good bubbles. It's a, it's a classic example of a well-done French sparkling uh, that's made very well and tastes very well. Yeah. And will actually, at that price point, surprise a lot of people who especially yeah. are used to it. Well, I think it's not too sweet also. Oh, I never, you know, we don't usually so. do sweet. 
Yeah. You know, and it doesn't have that yeasty characteristic. Not so at all. A lot of times you have a champagne, it, it comes off a little yeasty, mm -hmm. which is why I, I steer away from champagne a lot of times. But yeah. This one, yeah. fantastic. That's nice. Now, Bob, it's, what, what no, is the 90 price? Points. Uh, 90 points on Wine Spectator and mm -hmm. Wine Enthusiast. This is under the $20 range, which under is 20. phenomenal. Okay. Under 20 yeah. yeah, it tastes like a great value. So oh. I'll show you one other thing, too, which is that another way you can eat brie is with a fresh strawberry. Um, a lot of cheeses pair great with fruit, and brie's no exception. So if you'd like to try, I will. I have a uh, slice of that, too. I think we should do another small pour, then. Well, it sounds like the right decision. I was going to say, it was a shame to, to eat that without the champagne, but... You know, I, I probably should have poured a little I'm bit bigger to start I'm glad you're stepping in off. and taking <laughs> charge here. We have four wines tonight, so I realize that uh, we'll probably be drinking a little faster than we normally do, because mm. we'll be tasting some of Charles' wonderful cheese. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the fruit brings out kind of a salty characteristic, and I, I, I don't know if that's coming from the cracker or the cheese, but it's, it's such a contrast from what we were tasting earlier. Yeah, yeah, it could be. I mean, the cracker that I chose is a um, actually an almond cracker, mm. and so it's got really nice flavors. It is lightly salted. Um, it's a great cracker because it's gluten-free, and so if you're hosting a party and you maybe have a guest who's gluten-free, um, you can mix it up with, with all the mm -hmm. cheeses and not have anything to worry about. Actually, it's another good point, Charles, because we've talked about in the past when you have a wine party or wine dinner, mm -hmm. sometimes this is all you need with maybe uh, some prepared meat, some salami or something yeah, like that. You absolutely. don't need to cook something. This will work for a bunch of people. That's right, yeah. And I mean, there's a lot of different options when it comes to charcuterie, um, different types of salami, different types of prosciutto. Um, you can add nuts to the table, whether it's almonds, pistachios, or kind of a trendy thing to add to a cheese plate. So I think when you build a cheese platter, people are just looking for variety. Um, they're looking for some new options they haven't seen yep. before. Um, and so what I try to do, and what we have a little bit of here, is to um, vary the types of milk that are used in making mm -hmm. the cheese. And then people yep. just get different flavor profiles as they um, shop their way through the platter. And all these, I'm sorry, Jim, all these cheeses are available at Chapman. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I know there's a lot of options, um, certainly, when it comes to buying cheese. Um, but, you know, we want everybody to know we're in the cheese game and, yep. you know, we're cheese fans in our store. And all these are available. Well, it used to be supermarkets didn't really have good selections of cheeses. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm glad to see that that's changing now. Yeah, that you've got absolutely. Yeah. You sort of have to because there's so much competition out there. Yeah, there is. And I think customers are just, you know, people today um, are looking for adventure when mm -hmm. they're looking for food. Um, you know, there's um, so many options and um, people just want something exciting, you know. So I think cheese is an area, you know, wine's an area, beer's an area where even supermarkets can kind of step up their game and yeah. offer something new. And watching this show is an option too. Absolutely. That's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so Jim, I think the next one is going to be you, I believe. All right, next we have a Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, this is my current favorite. I, I go through a lot of favorites. I drink a lot of Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, this is the one I've been drinking quite a bit of the last few months. Uh, it's from New Zealand. It's going to, uh, it's, and it's a very affordable Sauvignon Blanc too. This is in the 10 to $15 range. Uh, but this gives you a lot of grapefruit uh, and some kiwi, which okay. I found intriguing. You know, normally uh, you, you talk about grapefruit in a Sauvignon Blanc, it's overly citrusy. Um, and, and if that's what you're looking for, that's great. Uh, but this is kind of a muted, uh, grapefruit taste, and then the, the kiwi kind of levels it out. Okay, great. And what are we going to pair this with? So this is going to be going with our Port Salou. Um, Port Salou is a semi-soft cow's milk cheese. Um, it's a mellow flavor cheese. Um, you'll see it's similar in texture to like a mozzarella cheese. Um, when I taste it, I do taste a, a little bit of citrus, even a little bit of lemon. Um, and it has a nice um, buttery flavor to it. So um, this cheese, you can eat it um, on its own. So we're going to be eating it just on a cracker today. But you could also put this over a um, salad of baby greens and just with a little olive oil, salt, and pepper for a, a simple salad option. So that's And still have wine with that. Absolutely. Of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. There you go. My pleasure. And it, is it accustomed to smell the cheese too? Can you do that? Uh, you certainly can, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of cheeses. Um, it's actually interesting that the smell doesn't always correspond with the taste. And what I mean by that is sometimes a cheese with a very strong smell may actually have a very mild flavor. And we're actually going to taste a cheese like that tonight. So definitely a characteristic you want to take a look at. Um, but it can be a little bit deceiving too, which is interesting. Well, wine can be the same way, which is, again, why these just pair together so well. They have so much... So many similarities, uh, but a lot of times you smell a wine, 
and you get certain aromas that don't end up in the taste. Mm -hmm. And you get yeah. completely different flavors when you're tasting the wine. Yep. Yeah, the same can happen with cheese. Another good choice, by the way, Jim um, and Charles, really delicious with the Sam Blanc and this particular cheese, it goes really good. Oh, fabulous pairing. Love that. Yeah, and this, this cheese, I was taking a look at the region. Um, you know, when you're thinking about pairing wines and cheese, a good place to start is to try to determine where the cheese is made mm -hmm. and what types of wine come from that region. So this would also go great with a Sancerre wine, which is a you know, very popular French wine. Um, Chenin Blanc and um, Cabernet Franc also. So a lot of different options for this um, cheese. It comes from the Loire Valley mm -hmm. um, in France. So. And uh, when you talk about cheeses in regards to prices, uh, we have to sort of, we can't say exactly what the prices are. Mm -hmm. Do cheeses vary in prices too significantly? Can they, they run the gamut from inexpensive to super expensive? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like any other product, um, you know, you sort of have your conventional mass-produced items. That doesn't mean they aren't, some of those aren't very flavorful and very fun to eat. Um, cheese is usually sold by the pound. Um, and we have items, you know, anywhere from three, four dollars a pound up to twenty-five, thirty dollars a pound. Um, and in fact, when you're shopping in stores, um, our store doesn't uh, price like this. But often you'll see cheese priced by the quarter pound, um, which is a way of not shocking you <laughs> yeah. with the actual price <laughs> per pound. So if you have a cheese that's twenty-five, thirty dollars a pound, it's a little easier to say that that's five or six dollars for a quarter pound. So Very you'll much see so. that on the signs. Yeah. Um, there, but yeah, most of these cheeses, um, you know, in in the um, uh, the quantity or the weight that you'd be buying, you know, for a simple dinner or a cheese platter, are going to cost less than five or ten dollars for that piece. So, how much? I was just going to ask, how much do people tend to buy when they're buying a piece of cheese? You know, some people like to buy a little cheese for a dessert, you know, for a little treat for themselves. Um, you know, and those are people who might buy one type of cheese a week, just in a small quantity. Um, obviously, you know, we're in a holiday uh, time right now, and so when people are thinking of holiday gatherings, that's when people are thinking cheese platters, mm -hmm. and, you know, they're more looking to buy in bulk. And so when you come to the store, we do have bulk options, so we have club size items, um, cheddars, goudas, you know, sort of your cheeses that everybody knows and loves. Mm -hmm. um, and then really what we have today is a little more of a showcase of some of the um, specialty cheeses, maybe a little higher price points, but more for a special occasion. You know, I want to say that we all have to have our traditional Easter meal, but I got to be honest with you, personally, I know my mother's not watching this show, <laughs> I would prefer something like this for Easter at the family gathering, just a little mm -hmm. bit of maybe salami or pepperoni, Absolutely. rather some meat in this, instead yeah. of all the rigmarole that goes with yeah. the well, rogues, And you know what, you can kibasa. have uh, this out, you know, uh, oftentimes when you're hosting a party, there's a little bit of la last minute stress as you're trying to finish up the food preparation. But if there's a cheese platter out and there's a bottle of wine open, you can kind of prepare in your kitchen and the guests are yep. probably going to be content. So it's a good strategy to have. All right. Keep that in mind, guests, for people watching the show. <laughs> and if you do a big spread like this, you can make a smaller meal. You know, people will tend to fill, fill up Absolutely. on cheese. That is true. Yeah, yeah, if that's it's, true. Yeah, good yeah. stuff like this, they're going to eat a lot more of it. So you Absolutely. can, you can say, you know what, I'll just a, have a smaller yeah. entree. I have that problem myself. Yeah. Whenever <laughs> I see a cheese platter, I can fill up pretty quick on it. And actually, that's one of the problems I also have. When me and my wife go out, we get the cheese sampler platter. Mm -hmm. You eat that, and before your meal comes, you're already full. Yeah. So it's sort yeah. of a double-edged sword. It's a risk. It is know, a risk. It's a risk. All right, so I think we're in for our first red tonight, okay. which um, I think is kind of special. I've had this several times. I have a few bottle, bottles of this in my cellar. It's a Belarus Côte d'Arone. It's from the actual southern region of the other Côte d'Arone region. So the wines from that region tend to be a little richer, brighter, and a little bit higher in alcohol. It's also a little bit the, a region where some of the more affordable Côte d'Arone come from. The northern Côte d'Arone could be astronomically priced, hundreds mm -hmm. of dollars, 75 or more. Uh, the southern region, you get a little bit more affordable coats grown in the $30, $40, $50 $50 range, and sometimes even a little less. Mm. Um, this one is a 60% Grenache and a 40% Syrah blend. I think it's, I, I've had this many times. I love this particular coats grown. It's certainly better than some of the generic ones you would find in some of your local large liquor stores. What will we be pairing with this, Joe? So this is going to be a Petit Basque cheese. Um, this is uh, probably my favorite cheese that we're going to eat tonight. Um, it's this one back here. And um, it may look familiar. So it has this nice um, bread basket pattern here on the rind, um, which is similar to a Manchego cheese. Mm -hmm. uh, Manchego is a very popular Spanish cheese that's made with sheep's milk. And so the cheese that we're going to be eating is actually a French version, I guess you could say. Um, it's a version that was produced by a large French cheese company. 
and they believed um, that there was a market in the U.S. for sheep's milk cheese, but they believed that our um, delicate palates, American palates, um, <laughs> couldn't Unsof really, unsophisticated. Yeah, very unsophisticated palates, <laughs> that, that, the, uh, that the bold flavors of Manchego would just overpower mm -hmm. and overwhelm us. So this is sort of a more mild version. Um, right. It still has a lot of the same characteristics, sort of a nutty flavor to it. Um, but it's a little bit more mild in flavor, and I think it's just great. So um, it should pair well um, with this wine. So we'll get you a piece here. Yeah, Manchego's happens to be one of my favorite cheeses. Yeah, mine yeah. As well. every it's cheese fabulous. platter I have uh, has Manchego yeah. on it for sure. So, and maybe now a petit basque. It's so delicious just on mm -hmm. its own. Mm -hmm. But I can see your point that it's it's just a little toned down from the Manchego. It is, yeah, a lot of the similar characteristics, similar flavor, uh, similar flavor profile, but just a little bit easier, you know, uh, a little bit mellower there. And once again, no bias here, but to me, this particular coat goes perfectly with this cheese. It's a great pairing. Uh, there's just yeah. enough character in this particular red to mm -hmm. not overpower this cheese, mm -hmm. and they just complement each other so well. Yeah. I think Manchego too, it, it might be personal preference, but I think it goes well with some of the Spanish blends that are out there. Um, you know, and I think this one, you know, it's a nice French blend and mm -hmm. I think it works great. Yeah, this is a very, it's a very mild French blend, which yeah. is sometimes surprising because sometimes yeah. there's so many tannins in a French red mm -hmm. that it's a little overpowering to some people, but this is very smooth. You know, well, this red had a little bit of a tobacco note to it and that gets very muted once you eat the cheese with that. It, it almost disappears. Mm. Not a tobacco smell, but uh, kind of a flavor when you're tasting the wine. Very smooth. You know, there's over 170 regions in the Costa Rica area that villages that manufacture wine, which is just fascinating when you think about it. Really that is. many little yeah. chateaus and yeah. places yeah. that are making it. And you know that in each of those, you know, the different geography, the different soil, the slightly different climate, I'm sure it all has an impact on the flavor. Yeah, I think the, the ones from the north especially, because they tend to be higher priced a little bit more, um, intense and complex, mm -hmm. which is why they command such a higher price for the mm -hmm. for the true wine connoisseur that's mm -hmm. looking knows right. what they're looking for. Right. But right. I, I'm I'm inclined to go with the southern region Côte de Rhone because yeah. they tend to be smoother, more easy to drink, and they pair, in my opinion, a little bit better with the cheese mm -hmm. than other food food groups. Yeah, no so, argument there. So a winner. All righty. All right, Bob, tell us about this last wine. Oh, the Barbera. You know, it, it was tough. I was going to go with a whole french theme show tonight. <laughs> but, you know, Charles was bringing in a lot of great cheeses, and I thought, well, why just limit it to the Frenchies? I said, let's have some Italian on there also. So <laughs> this is the Piemonte Barbera, northern Italy. Uh, it's two of the most important regions in Italy for winemaking, are the Piedmont in the northwest, Veneto in the northeast. And uh, wines from this region can vary in prices significantly. Um, to medium, to low, to extremely high prices. And, you know, Jim, we've done wine shows for Italian wines in the past. I know uh, Tony's been on the show. And uh, Barbera's can be pretty expensive. Yeah. A, yeah, a really good one can be up there in price. This is a nice, moderately priced Barbera, which should give us the characteristics we would expect in an Italian Barbera without going too far into our wallets. Mm -hmm. So this is under, I think, $25 for a bottle. And uh, let me go, Jim. Um, so I, I've had this a few times too, but I've never actually paired this particular wine with cheese like we're doing tonight. So Great. tell me what we're doing. All right, so <clears throat> the final cheese I have, uh, I took a risk on this one, and it's not a risk because of the flavor. I know that it tastes great, but this is the hardest cheese to pronounce that I chose. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so I've, I've been sweating this moment for the entire uh, <laughs> taping so far. So this is our Blue Davernier cheese and I, I think I actually I think uh, you said, it. It, said it right on that try so um, this is a blue cheese and so um, you know there are people who love blue cheese they mm -hmm. look forward to the strong flavor I'm one um, of there are people who fear blue cheese um, you know it looks a little bit strange it has a stronger smell to it um, definitely has some strong flavors um, but I think this is one of the tastiest um, and most delicious blue cheeses mm -hmm. that's out there um, it is made with rye bread mold injections. That's what causes um, the blue veins. And they also aerate the cheese, and that's what allows the, uh, the mold to start to grow and to cause um, the veins. Um, this can be paired with um, dessert-style wines, which is common for blue cheeses, or very strong, uh, bold, flavored red wines as well. Um, I have a little tip for um, blue cheeses. Um, if you're hosting and you have people who are a little bit intimidated, by blue cheese, then a nice little trick is to add a drop or two of honey 
to the blue cheese and a couple almonds. And the honey kind of adds a sweetness to it. Yeah. And the almonds add a little bit of crunch and some other additional flavors. And it can really help bring that strong flavor into balance. And that's a good way to sell people who are nervous about blue cheese. Once they try it in that fashion, sometimes it'll open up their, uh, their mind a little bit that's on blue cheese. That's a great cheese, tip. So. It is so. a great tip. And some people are not only nervous about the name blue cheese, but also about the color. Mm -hmm. I just, people who don't know cheese, say, well, that's just a little lettuce in there, you know. Cause <laughs> <laughs> you don't tell them it's the mold or anything. Yeah, you know. It freaks some people out. That's true, you um, know. And, of course, you know, at, at ShopRite uh, in life, we're very concerned about food safety, yes, you know. Yes. And so mold seems like it that could seem be like a, a bad, bad thing. Um, but you know what? In this case, obviously, carefully honed techniques that have been used for centuries. We know it's safe. We yeah. know it's delicious. And so. And I know I'm eager to taste it. All so right. It's one of so my let's give it a try. Actually, I'll give you the version with uh, honey and all. Almonds. There you go. Now, I tried the wine on its own, Bob, and again, fabulous. Full body, a lot of fruit jumping out at me. No real harsh tannins with this. Uh, it's got a nice, clean, easy finish, so I, I like this wine just on its own. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what the cheese does with, to the wine. That, your combination really does tone the cheese down. Doesn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, if you want to really go for it, we can offer you the... A bold blue on its own here. Classic example of a rather strong cheese, which is completely tempered by the mm -hmm. Barbera, mm -hmm. but in a positive way, not a negative way. They really complement each other very well. Mm -hmm. They do. Yeah, that works well together. I was tempted to bring a dessert wine tonight. I almost brought mm -hmm. a port or uh, a Spanish sherry. And uh, that the sherry probably would not have worked well with this particular cheese, but the port would have gone yeah, I think so. with this. And I think it's, it's important to note, too, I think, you know, when people are, are planning a party and you're looking at wine and cheese pairings, um, it can be a little intimidating, but there's great information online. And the good thing about these cheeses is a number of the cheeses we've tasted would have gone well with other wines. Yeah. And so as an example, the brie that we tasted was from the Côtes d'Aron region. And so that would have been actually a pretty good pairing to try that one. Um, and the blue you know, could go with a dessert wine um, as well. So, you know, you can be a little bit creative. You shouldn't be too nervous about getting it wrong, yep. you know, picking the wrong pairing because your guests, you know, they'll mix and match. If you have some charcuterie and cured meats, if you have some nuts, they'll kind of learn to make their own combinations and learn what they like the best. And that's the advice I give to our viewers here. I have two rules of thumb. And, and the first one is try, drink what you like. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, if, if you drink a wine that isn't what we're trying to, we're suggesting tonight is the ideal pairing, Go ahead and do it anyway. Absolutely. You, yep. you, the only you're not you're not wrong in doing that. If it tastes good sure. to you, do it. Absolutely. And I'm I'm looking forward to trying the brie with the coconut. Yeah, Rone. we could do it. Yeah, I think we have time. So. Okay. Well, why don't we cut a little more brie then? This is our brie here. I will say it's, it's, it, the reason this show is also good to finally do a cheese pairing is because cheese is in so many ways like wine. Mm -hmm. um, it ages. Mm -hmm. um, you know it. it it's very comforting to the palate, and there's a lot of flavor and interesting characteristics that happen when you taste it, which mm -hmm. is exactly what happens when you drink wine. Yeah. And there's so many interesting cheeses um, from around the world, and really, you know, there's always something new to try. There's always a new cheese to learn about. There'll be a new trend, and, um, you know, I think that's kind of the case with wine, you know. There's well, always something new to learn yeah. about, a new region, yep. a new technique. And new grape varietals um, that always pop Absolutely, up. yeah. And the cheeses we're eating today, these are all French cheeses. Um, but there's great cheese um, being made here in the United States. There's great cheese in Connecticut with Cato's Corner mm -hmm. Farms um, and others. Um, there's cheeses from California that are just, you know, internationally award-winning cheeses um, just waiting to be discovered. So. I've had some really good goat cheese from this area, mm -hmm. uh, upstate New York in particular. And I, Bob, that's really not... Uh, something you enjoy. But not a goat, goat cheese. No, not, he's not it's a, one of the few cheeses that I really <clears throat> don't care for. I will consume it when necessary, but it's not <laughs> my favorite. It's not my favorite. Well, I have a goat cheese that may change your mind, and I, I don't have it here, but there's a cheese called Humboldt Fog, which is from Northern California, and it gets its name um, from the fog uh, that rolls off the Pacific Ocean into the uh, northwest area of California. Um, and it is a uh, goat's milk cheese, but it's made in a similar um, style to the way that brie is made. So it's a bloomy rind cheese, and it has a nice layer of vegetable ash down the middle. So it's got some great characteristics. It looks great. 
it may just change your life, you know, give it a shot. Um, unlike some of our viewers, I'm very open to trying different things. <laughs> you know, we've tried to have people, or that's the whole point of the show, is to try different wines that you generally wouldn't. Think of this show as the exact same way with cheese. Try different cheeses that mm -hmm. you've never been exposed to because you might be pleasantly surprised. Absolutely. Now, it's funny, you were talking about trying to, uh, all the different cheeses that could go with the wine. Uh, I was coming from this from the complete opposite direction. I was trying to think of, you know, how many, if I were just to get one wine to go mm -hmm. with a bunch of different cheeses, what would I pick? Ooh, good one. Yeah. And you really, you can't do that. There's no single wine that goes well with everything. That's um, true. You know, if you're, if you're going to try and do that, you could go with, you know, a Cab or a Pinot Noir or a Sherry. Mm -hmm. But really, you do have to think about, you know, what cheese am I having? What wine am I having? And, yeah. And there, you know, you'll get some some wines that'll work with some cheeses yeah. and some that won't. And I would think for most people, um, if you're a wine lover, you start with the wine. You know, you right. choose the wines that you want and the wines that are important to you. Um, if you love cheese, maybe start with the cheeses and, and just work backwards from there. Um, but again, I mean, you can, you know, go online, you can just do a Google search, you can go to Chowhound. There's so many yeah. resources out there um, and so many gourmet people yeah. um, who are arguing about this and writing about <laughs> this all day and just learn from that. You know? Well, I know it, your family's been in the food business for a while, which is why you're in the food business. And absolutely. When did yeah. you really get into cheese? Was it something that just hit you with you know, your love of wine? I, I have to admit, I mean, I started as a simple fan of cheese, just, you know, grilled cheeses, paninis, you know, um, trying to get through college and make sure you're eating something. Yep. So mac and cheese, I, I'm not above eating Velveeta mm. cheese, you know, mm -hmm. and so um, I think as I um, got into the supermarket business, what I really started to look at are what are the different categories and different areas within the store where we can be different um, and where we can kind of stand out from the conventional grocer. And I think that there's a couple areas that we're looking at in our store, and one is craft beers. Um, you know, your meat department certainly, your seafood department, all your fresh departments. But cheese, to me, stood out as an area that, you know, I think um, some of our competitors just kind of slack out the mm -hmm. same cheese that every other store has. Um, and that works for them. But, you know, for us, I think it's an area of differentiation that yeah. we're looking to harness. And so I've tried to learn a little bit more about it. Um, you know, people know that when they're coming to a party at my house, there's going to be a cheese platter. There's going to be four or five As cheeses. I do now, too, and Jim <laughs> knows, yeah. yes. So, um, you know, it's just kind of a little side passion. And what's cool is, um, you know, for our stores, even though we're part of a large brand, you know, it says shop right on the mm -hmm. door, we're all family-owned and operated. Mm -hmm. And that gives us a lot of flexibility um, to put into place programs that we think are right for the marketplace. And here in West Hartford, um, and in our area, you know, people have great taste. And so you know, it's exactly right. You know, our remaining couple minutes of the show, I wanted to say that you're exactly right, which is why ShopRite to me is, is so special because you know the market here in, in town. Yeah. You yeah. know, you, this isn't your normal town. People expect quality and they expect Absolutely. variety yeah. when they come Absolutely. in. And that's what you guys offer. And yeah. uh, you can compete just as well with the Whole Foods and some of their other markets yeah. when it comes to, well, we're talking about cheese tonight, but mm -hmm. I like their store too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, yeah. you know, that when I was doing research for the show, that was something I came across too, is uh, so many people online were complaining about uh, the, the small selection of cheeses that were at their mm -hmm. local supermarket. And they said, right. you know, I have to go to some specialty shop and I got to drive, you know, 40 minutes sure. out of my way. Yep. So it's, it's comforting to hear. There's a perception, too, of going to a specialty store. Am I paying too much? Exactly. Is this a good value? Exactly. Um, you know, it becomes almost an indulgence. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, for us, um, when we're selling these cheeses, we don't necessarily need to look for the markup that might be on a cheese like this at a specialty shop mm -hmm. because we're selling a whole lot of other items that can kind of help carry the overhead. And so yeah. I think the prices that we offer on these items are, are going to be pretty competitive. And it's, it's more convenient, too, it because is. they can yeah. buy all the rest of their groceries. At Absolutely, store, yeah. Rather than going you know, to the cheese shop <laughs> and course. the wine shop and yeah. some other shop. Absolutely, so. And yeah. that doesn't hurt. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't, yeah, and hope, you know, with any luck, someday maybe we'll be able to sell wine in the store. You know, you never know. So today it's just beer, but there's a lot of um, states where wine is sold in stores, and you know that would be uh, a cause for another show, probably. Yeah. Right. We'd well, have to well, come together once coming. more. Absolutely. So, Charles, I want to thank you for being on the show. And besides bringing these great cheeses in, you've been a great guest. Thank you very much. And the wines we've had tonight just work so wonderfully with your cheese. I want to thank you very much. For thank that. you. It's been my pleasure. Appreciate and uh, Jim, once again, thank you for your selection. Your New Zealand Kona was fantastic. I, I'm going to have to bring some more. Uh, we'll get into some ports sometime in the future and maybe some sherries, and we'll have you back on and do some more cheeses with uh, kind of dessert-oriented wines. I but, won't uh, be turning down an invitation. All right. There's a lot in store for the coming spring and summer, so people don't go away. So I want to thank everybody for watching. As always, I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And until next time, keep, keep all us of us in your wine cellar. cellar.